Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your word. It is the truth. We do receive it written in our heart and mind. We thank you for the revelation of it. We thank you for what you're going to bring forth this night. We'll be doers of the word and see the fruit of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We've been talking about many important subjects to bring you to the place of being the glorious church, to bring you to the place of being holy. We talked about walking blamelessly, walking in holiness, walking and not being defiled, walking and coming to the place of being unrebukable, unreprovable in his sight, holy, not defiled, walking uprightly before him in the morning message. Tonight we're going to talk about walking worthy before the Lord, which is of absolutely a necessity. Every one of us have been called. We saw even this morning that we are called to be holy and to be without blame before the Lord from the very foundation of the world. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, he says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord. How did he become the prisoner of the Lord? You and I have been bought with a price. We belong to Jesus. We are not our own. We're a purchased possession. We're his. And he understood that. I'm the prisoner of the Lord. I am the servant, the bond slave of the Lord, as he really is essentially saying. I'm in bonds unto the Lord. He said, I beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called. The word vocation means a calling. If you're here for the first time in the lower window, this is Strong's, the numbers are going to Strong's Concordance. Greek words or Hebrew words, if we're in the Old Testament, with information about it that we refer to from time to time. This is a calling. So you're to walk worthy of the calling wherewith you are called. You have a calling, but you've got to walk worthy of that calling by doing what the Word says. Because remember, it's, it's absolutely essential for you to fulfill the call of God in your life. Of course, we know at Matthew 22... Verse 14 says, Many are called, but few are chosen. The many is of everybody who's been called, has come to the Lord. The few chosen are the ones that obey that calling. They walk out what they've been called to do. God expects us to be obedient to the calling of God. And it talked about how we're to walk worthy. When we obey the calling of God, we're going to be found worthy before the Lord. When we talk about this being worthy, this is talking about one who is worthy of or deserving or fitting to receive something, being entitled to it, meriting it, essentially, suitable for it. That's one of the words we'll see tonight in the Greek. <coughs> the second word is a word which refers to a character, being worthy and fit in character and worthy of attaining to something, being competent to see these things come to pass. You and I must walk worthy of the Lord to see Him accomplish what He purposes. Well, how is this going to come to pass? First of all, are we worthy in ourselves? No. Who is the worthy one? Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. Jesus is the worthy one. Thou art worthy, speaking of Jesus, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. He's the one who not only created all things, but He also brought forth the new creation as you. When we receive Jesus, be born again, we become a new creation. We get a brand new spirit on the inside of us. As we mentioned, we are not worthy of our, in ourselves. First of all, we have to get born again and get a brand new spirit to come into relationship with God to begin to have a relationship with Him. We see over in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. He says, I indeed baptize you with water into repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. This is before anybody was born again. And he had, this is a, a word, of course, that God was giving him as he was speaking forth. He would realize that he was not even worthy to bear even his shoes because we are not worthy in ourselves. Jesus is the one who makes us worthy when we are born again, coming into relationship. But that's not all there is to it. Just because we're born again and get a new spirit, that doesn't mean that we're automatically worthy of everything. 
That just is the entrance into relationship with him. We see further in Luke chapter 7, beginning in verse 2. There was a centurion, a certain centurion servant. He was dear to him. He was sick, and he was ready to die. So when he heard of Jesus, knowing what, heard, what Jesus could do, bring healing, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. First he sent the elders of the Jews to Jesus. When they came, the elders of the Jews came to Jesus. They besought him instantly, saying that he was worthy for whom he should do this. They said, you should do this because he's a worthy person. Was he worthy? No. He wasn't worthy whatsoever. He was a centurion. He wasn't in covenant relationship with God. But that's what the Jews said. And why did they say that? For he loveth our nation, and he built us a synagogue. He did something for us. We got something from him. Works that were pleasing to us. Well, that was, of course, them. They were all about themselves, unfortunately. Well, Jesus went with them and followed on. In verse 6, he went with them when he was now not far from the house. The centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter unto my roof. He knew he wasn't in covenant relationship with God. He knew he was not worthy himself before. All the Jews, of course, were wrong, and he understood this. Verse 7, Wherefore neither thought on myself worthy to come unto thee. I'm not even worthy to come to you. But say in a word, and my servant shall be healed. Just speak the word, he was telling him, because he wanted to see his servant be healed. So the elders said he was worthy because of his works, the things he had done. But he says, I'm not worthy even to come unto you, recognizing that he's not in covenant relationship with God. Now, you and I must come into covenant relationship with him to be in a position to be worthy. At the same time, as you will see, your works are going to be important in being shown to be worthy before the Lord. The centurion had the right attitude. He was humble. He understood. He wasn't in covenant. So being not worthy, or being worthy before God as you have to certainly become a, a born-again Christian and have a new spirit to be right with God before you could be. But it's also more than that, as you will see. Our works are important. Many people have thought, well, I'm born again, so that means everything's fine. Well, that's just part of it. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we come down to verse 5. Remember, our worthiness is not in us, it's the Lord. For 2 Corinthians 3, 5, not that we are sufficient. This is a different word for being meet or worthy or a of, of sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves. Our sufficiency is of God. Our being fit, our being worthy is of God. That's the only one who makes us worthy. He goes on and says, who also hath made us able or worthy ministers of the New Testament. This is the same word. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, and the Spirit gives life. So you and I are sufficient, competent, worthy to be something because of what the Lord has done in our life. We come to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3 and verse 8. We see, begin to see as we look at many scriptures of being worthy is not just being born again, it's also your walk, what you do, your works that are going to be important to show that you're worthy before God. Look what he says, Luke 3, 8. Bring forth, therefore, fruits worthy of repentance that would merit or, or true repentance that shows forth that you really have repentance. Well, that tells you something. You've got to have fruits showing you've repented. Not just the fact that I say I repent. Anybody can say I repent. Anybody can change their mind just for a moment even and say I repented. No, it's going to be shown by your fruits. Just saying something or even doing something on a temporary basis but not seeing the change and the new fruit in your life, without it, you haven't come to true repentance. Otherwise, what's going to show that you are worthy of God 
recognizing that you truly have come to repentance. It's because of the fact that you have brought forth fruit. And then he comes to verse 9. Now also the axe is laid into the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, which bringeth not forth good fruit is cut, hewn down or cut, off, cut down and cast into the fire. That's quite a statement. You and I are the trees, the trees of righteousness. We are to bring forth fruit. Remember, we're the branches tied into the vine. If we don't bring fruit, remember the branch is cast away. He gets burned. That's the same thing. If we're not bringing forth good fruit, we will be cut down and cast into the fire. So are we going to be considered worthy and, and suitable for God and, and right before Him, fitting before the Lord? No. True repentance is going to be shown forth in having fruit. Without fruit, we all have repentance. We have not been changed. We have not been reformed. And really, and really when we talk about repentance, this particular word really can be thought of as being really reformed. And there's a change, a change shown by the fruit in your life, not just a change of mind also. So that's one aspect. But we see something else also over in Acts chapter 26. In Acts chapter 26, verse 20. He first showed the, unto them of Damascus and Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God, and what else? And do works meet or showing forth this repentance. Meet or showing that you are worthy of repentance, showing that you are, have accomplished this, you're deserving of it, you're fitting, you've merited it. This is the same word, axios, that we see. Meriting anything that's worthy. So, that tells us another thing. True repentance is shown by works. Your works have changed. In fact, you've changed and you're doing the things that God wants you to do. So you and I must have continual works. And when it talks about doing these works, this isn't just I did them for a moment. It's a present tense in the Greek. The present tense means continuous, repeated, ongoing action. Meaning I'm continually doing works, showing forth suitable proving, meriting the fact that I have come to repentance. So, we see that without fruit, we're not going to be seen to be worthy of repentance. Without works, we aren't worthy of repentance, so we're not going to be shown to be walking worthy before the Lord without that. Now we come to Ephesians chapter 4, where we started out. I therefore, the prison of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the calling wherewith you're called, and how you to walk with all lowliness and meekness and long suffering, forbearing, holding up one another in love, endeavoring to keep the union of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Otherwise, how can you show that you're walking worthy of the Lord? It's by what you're doing, isn't it? It's by the character established into the fruit in your life, the works that you do. You have a lowliness of mind. You're humble, this means. You have meekness, a gentleness, a mildness. You're long-suffering, not ready to be judgmental or write somebody off. You're holding others up, not tearing them down. You're endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, diligent to do this. This is what God wants. He wants every one of us to come to the place of your walk showing forth His character. That shows that you are walking worthy of His calling because you are humble, you're gentle and long-suffering and holding one another up. We also see over in Colossians, in order to walk worthy of the Lord and show Him that you are right before Him, Colossians chapter 1, verse 9 tells us something important. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge. This is the precise, correct knowledge of His, of, of his will, the Word of God, in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So we need to get the Word of God in us, precise, correct knowledge, wisdom and spiritual understanding, 
what's that going to produce? Or what's the purpose? That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. As Young brings it out, to your walking worthy of the Lord. Otherwise, as you get knowledge, understanding, and wisdom, then you'll be able to walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. If you don't get it, will you be able to walk worthy of the Lord? No. That means we need to get knowledge. We need to get wisdom. We need to get understanding. Remember in the Proverbs, it talks about get wisdom, get understanding. These things, the wisdom's the principal thing. So you walk in the ways of the Lord and able to walk worthy of the Lord and all pleasing because you're to please Him. What else will this produce? That you'll be fruitful in every good work. Because if you're walking worthy of the Lord, you're going to not only please Him, but you're going to be fruitful. Remember, fruit shows that you're walking worthy before the Lord. You're going to be increasing in the knowledge of God because you're going to be getting the Word in you. You're going to be strengthened with all might because of the Word in you. It's going to produce an empowerment in you. This is the word dunamo, which means strong or be empowered with all might. This is the word dunamis, strengthened with all power. It's a word for power. According to his glorious power, unto all patience, steadfastness, long-suffering, with joyfulness. This is all the character of the Lord being produced in you. You're going to be steadfast in the soulless realm, long-suffering, joyful, continually maintaining joy before the Lord. And then he goes on to verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father who has made us meet. This is one of the words for this about being worthy, being rendered fit or rendered sufficient or competent or be shown worthy to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Therefore, we've got to get the knowledge of God. We've got to get the spiritual understanding and the wisdom. And who gives that to us? The Lord does as we seek Him and we get in the Word of God and be a doer of it so that then you can walk worthy of the Lord. So that's a prerequisite for you being able to do it. What else will show us that we are walking worthy of the Lord if we're a laborer for Him? Luke chapter 10, verse 7. In the same house remain eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his hire. He is worthy of his hire. So you're going to be shown worthy of your hire as a laborer, and you're going to then be blessed. God will bless you as you go out to be a laborer working for the Lord. He's called every one of us to be a laborer. Matthew chapter 10, we pick up over parallel to this in verse 10. He said, nor, nor script for your journey, nor, neither two coats, neither shoes, or yet staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. As they were going city to city. Whatever city or town you shall enter, inquire in it who is worthy. Find somebody who is worthy. You just don't go with anybody. You don't have fellowship with the people that are walking wrong. You want to find someone who is considered worthy before the Lord, walking right, born again. And there abide till you go thence. It goes on and says, when you come into a house, salute it. If the house be worthy, if it's walking right, if it's in line with the word of God, then let your peace come upon it. But if it be not worthy, this, is, this house is not worthy. They're not walking right at all. Let your peace return to you. In other words, you should only have fellowship with those people who are found to be worthy before the Lord, who are walking in the ways of the Lord. You don't want to be in fellowship with those who aren't. That's why he says if, you're, if he's not worthy, you let your peace return to you and you move on. And then it's quite a statement it makes. It says, whoever will not receive you that would be someone who is not going to be worthy. Nor hear your words when you depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. This is essentially shaking off and showing, as this is expresses, extreme contempt for another and refusing to have any further dealings with them because they rejected the gospel. Shake off even for a cleansing of oneself that you might have been contaminated by anything. You, they won't listen to you. You move on. That means we can only have fellowship with those who are worthy. We, and those people that reject it, we move on to someone else. Because God wants us to preach the gospel to everybody. At the same time, we're not going to have fellowship with those people that are not walking right before the Lord. We see something even further that's important. So we come to Matthew chapter 10. Pick up here in verse 37. 
He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. If you're not found worthy of him, he's not going to manifest himself in any way. You're not going to be right before the Lord. You cannot love father or mother more than Jesus. You must put him first place. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. You can't put any family members or anybody before the Lord. When he talks about loving, this is not the word agape, it's the word phileo in the Greek, which means you're like fond of, a friend of, you're approving of. Essentially, if you're going to put them ahead of the Lord, because you're going to please them in some manner, you're not worthy of the Lord. Can we put any person above the Lord? Absolutely not. And then he goes on the next verse, and he says, He that taketh not his cross and follow after me, is not worthy of me either. If you are going to be found worthy of the Lord, you're going to walk in his ways and do what he says. And he's commanded us to take, the, take up our cross daily, which is the crucifying of the flesh, putting away all the deeds of the body so we don't walk in sin, and following after him. We follow after him as we're joining him, like a disciple this essentially means. Hearing and doing his word, that's what produces us being disciples. If we're not crucifying the flesh, if we're not following after him, doing his word to become a disciple, we're not worthy of him. Because we're to live unto him, remember, and not unto ourself. We see something further over in Luke chapter 15. This is talking about the prodigal son who left and went, and did sinful things. When he finally came to his senses, he says in Luke 5, 15, verse 18, I will arise and go to my father, and I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. Notice he sinned against his father. He also sinned against heaven. So he's sinning against God. And then he goes on and says, I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. When you walk in sin, are you going to be worthy before God? No. You're not worthy until you come to the place of repentance and have dealt with that. Well, we come down to, he arose, came to his father. Father had compassion on him, of course. Just like our heavenly father will have compassion on us when we come and we come to the place of repentance. The son said to the father, said unto him, Father, I've sinned against heaven in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Because he was walking in the ways of sin. If you walk in the ways of sin, you won't be worthy to be called a son either. The father said to his servants, because now he'd come to repentance, see, bring forth the best robe. The best really means first in time. It's the word protos in the Greek. Bring forth the first robe, otherwise what they had initially, and put it on him. You put it on means clothe him. He's to get clothed with this thing. So you're going to bring forth this first robe, and he's commanding them to put it upon him. Now when it talks about this robe, this first robe, it's very interesting. This word refers to a robe that's worn by kings and priests and persons of rank. What are we? We get born again, we are kings and priests unto God. We must understand we are a royal priesthood and a holy priesthood. We are in the family of God. We are kings. So bring forth the first robe that was for kings and priests and get it back on them. Well, that's what God will do for us when we confess our sins and repent. But that also tells you in your walking in sin, you don't have this robe on you. You put it off. Because that's why he says put it back on them. Put it on them. And also he says put a ring on on his finger and shoes on his feet. When you look at this and you study in the Bible dictionaries about what the rings were for back in those days, the ring was worn on a finger displaying the seal of the owner that they belonged to them. A, a ring is a seal of a mark of ownership. This is a Launida speaks of it in his lexicon, ring containing the signet of the owner by which he marked ownership. That's what the seal of the ring was. It was that you were owned by that particular person. Well, that means when he comes to repentance, he's now going to get the first robe like a king and a priest. 
He commanded to put him on. He'll get restored. And he's going to have this ring on his hand, the fact that he now is owned by the Lord. And the shoes on his feet now, that he's going to walk in the ways of the Lord. This speaks of restoration, which is what God wants. Very interesting. Bring hither, hither, hither the fatted calf, kill it, let us eat and be merry. And then he makes a statement. For this my son was dead. That means he was dead. He was still physically alive, but he was dead spiritually. And now he says he's alive again. He's recovered life. He's come back into life with God. He was lost or in a position of destruction, in a state of destruction. This is the word apolemy. means to be in a place of destruction. Otherwise, he was headed for hell in that state that he was in. And now he's found. The fact that it speaks of here that now he's found, in this sense, it means he's now come and returned to a place where he once was, because he's now back in the position that he was in before. And they began to be merry. That tells you something. It's very interesting when it talks here about the fact that, that he was dead. Speaking of the fact that he was dead, this is not just making us a, a statement, just throwing it off. It was a fact, actually. It's an indicative mood statement. It's a fact or a reality. He was dead. What does that tell you? That tells you the fact that if you turn away and you don't walk in the ways of the Lord, you're spiritually dead. You're still physically around, but you're spiritually dead and you're in a state of destruction and perishing if you don't come to the place of repentance. Evidence of this. Think of the man who had the incest. Remember that one? Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And they and it wouldn't repent of it. What did they come to say? What did Paul come and say here? He said he was going to deal with this thing and deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. Was he going to be saved? No. Now he's in the hands of the devil to destroy him. That the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Does that mean that he was going to be saved anyway? No. Because when it says that he may be saved, this is not a statement of fact. If it was, it would be an indicative mood in the Greek. Here for the first time we explain these things, but they're important to understand. The mood is a subjunctive mood. The subjunctive mood in the Greek expresses things contrary to fact that are conditional upon conditions being met. In other words, his spirit may be saved if conditions are met, not automatically. What would the condition be? He'd have to repent and turn away because he was in a state of perishing at that point. And they hadn't, weren't deal, dealing with it. They were allowing this to be in them. It was contaminating them. That's why he comes along. He says, your glory is not good. No, you're not a little leaven. Has leavened the whole lump. It's contaminated the whole group. Because you haven't de dealt with this situation. Which they should have gotten rid of him. This tells you something. And also will help you to understand what these scriptures mean. When it speaks here about these ones who rebelled against God and were spots in the feasts of charity, when they feast with you, feeding themselves with fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, or fruit went, it's gone now, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. This is actually not just, a, this isn't a noun here. This is a, a participle which would be better translated, having been twice dead. What happened? How's that? He was dead first. We were dead in our trespass and sins. We get born again. And then he sits there and he goes off and walks on all these wrong ways. He's now dead again. Now, does that mean he has to be born again? No, he still has the spirit of Christ but he's in a perishing state of being dead on the way. He's not right. He will not be saved unless he comes to true repentance. He got plucked up by the roots. 
Let me show you another scripture that will show you this. A lot of people, this startles them and it's hard maybe for them to understand, but it's the truth. Look at this scripture in 1 Timothy 5, 6, talking about widows. She that liveth in pleasure, and this word actually means one who has given themselves to pleasure. Are they living under the Lord? No. They're walking after the lusts of the flesh. They're sinning left and right. And this is the way they're living. They're living continually this way. Present tense, ongoing action. What's it say about her? She's dead. Meaning to be spiritually dead. This is what it's referring to. It's a metaphor for him to be spiritually dead while she is living and breathing. This is someone who was born again. And yet, living and breathing, but spiritually dead. Why? Because you're living in sin. If you're living in sin, you're spiritually dead and not right with God, just like the man from the, that had the uh, uh, prodigal son. He says he was dead. Now he's alive again. Otherwise, he was dead, even though he was alive, living physically. You walk away from the Lord, you're dead. Does that mean i got to get born again again? No. It means you're in a state of spiritual death and perishing because you haven't confessed your sin, repented, and turned from it, and got back right with the Lord. We know this from even in Matthew chapter 7. God sees you at the state you're in. Here we see in Matthew chapter 7, in verse 23, this is where he said, Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work, it's a present tense verb, that are working, ongoing, lawlessness. This is the word anomia, for it was translated iniquity here, which means lawlessness. Young's translates it correctly, are working lawlessness. Well, are they walking in the ways of the Lord anymore? No. How does God know you? He knows you at any point in time of what you are doing consistently. And that's why he says, depart from me. This guy's abiding in spiritual death because he's walking in working lawlessness continue, continually. That tells you something. If a person is not walking right with the Lord and is <clears throat> turned away from him once he's been born again, you can be twice dead. You can be living and yet dead, even though you're living physically. Why? Because you're not walking in the way of the Lord. Are you going to be worthy before the Lord? No. Remember, this guy was dead. He was alive, now he was dead. And now he's alive again, which means he's come back into spiritual life. Many people have not understood that. Many people thought, well, do I have to get born again, again? No. But what state are you in if you're not right? If you're a state of unrighteous, you're in trouble. If you're a state of lawlessness, you're in trouble. You're going to need to be right with the Lord at all times. Remember, God, we've brought this out many times before, God sees you at the point in time of what you're doing and what you're continuing to walk in. That's how, If you're walking in sin, are you righteous? Do you have the life of God in you? No. Little leaven leavens the whole lump. That's why he was telling them, you've got to deal with this. We've got to walk uprightly before the Lord. And if we're not, we are abiding in spiritual death. We would not be worthy before the Lord. Here we see quite a statement made over in Luke chapter 20, down here in verse 35. But they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world. First of all, the word world is not that. It's the word aeon in the Greek, which means age. It's talking about an age. That's why Young's translates it correctly. Those who would be accounted worthy. Who's going to count you as worthy? The Lord would be the one who would account you as worthy. Because this is a passive voice, meaning the person is looked upon by somebody else as accounted worthy. They which would be counted worthy, 
by the Lord because he sees you're walking in his ways, your works, your fruit, your character, all the things we've seen already, to obtain that age. What age? That's the millennial age. That's going to be the ones who are going to get there are going to be the ones who are walking before the Lord. That's what he's talking about. Because here he's in response to about when they were saying uh, that this man had a, his wife of seven different men he was married to and in the resurrection whose wife is she going to be? And of course he said the children of this world marry and are given in marriage but the ones here, if you're accounted worthy to obtain that age, you don't marry or are given in marriage. Yeah, that doesn't happen in the millennial reign for those people that have been already born again and have, have come to the place of being able to be worthy before the Lord to obtain that particular age. That tells you something. Are you going to be accounted worthy or judged worthy? What's that going to be based on? Your walk and your works. Are you walking worthy? Your fruit, what you're doing. All these things are so important. Luke chapter 21, verse 34. Take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, so that day come upon you unawares. That's all about the day of the Lord coming. If you're not ready and right, you're going to be in trouble. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. It's coming. And when it comes, it's going to come on every, everybody is going to be experiencing that. Look at the next verse. Watch, therefore, you're to be watching. This is the word. You've got to be spiritually awake. You can't be asleep. You've got to be spiritually watching. Present tense verb. Imperative mood, meaning it's a command to be spiritually watching and attentive. And praying always, because you're going to need to know how to pray to see God's power, His provision, conquering the enemies, taking dominion, prayers of authority, and you've got to be spiritually attuned, that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass. They're going to happen. You're counted worthy to escape. This means to be able to flee out of or seek safety. This is what the word means. Flee out of, literally, all the things that are going to come to pass. Certainly, the Lord will direct us when that time comes and show us. He always shows you what to do and always show you what to do to be one step ahead of what the devil wants. Remember when Herod wanted to kill Jesus, the, the, the Lord had already given him a dream and told him to get out and go, go to Egypt, get to safety. God will do that. But one thing's for sure, if you're not watching and praying, are you going to be accounted worthy to know what God wants you to do in that time? No. That means our walk with Him is absolutely essential in everything we do if we're going to be accounted worthy, even to be able to flee out of and be safe when all the judgments are coming and all the destructive things are going to come, which they are going to come down the line. Also, be encountered worthy. It's interesting. There's several places in the Word where it talks about this. We're just going to give you one. Where they understood that if you did some wrong things, you'd be worthy of death. Luke 23, 15. No, nor not Herod, for I sent him to you, and lo, nothing worthy of death is done unto him. Nothing worthy of death. Well, if you and I are walking in the way of the Lord, we won't have anything worthy of death for us. But if you're walking in the way of sin and you're not walking right, you're going to be in trouble. These are the ones that are not going to be protected. These are the ones that get martyred. These are the ones that may not even make it to the next age if they don't repent and turn and walk in the ways of the Lord. Your deeds determine whether you are what you're worthy of. Because that's what they're saying. Hey, they hadn't done anything, deeds, that are worthy of death. Remember what we're going to be judged by? What are we, what are we judged by? Our works. Remember the books are opened, and what are, what's, what, what are they looking at? All the works. That's what we're going to be judged by. This is why your works are important.
Now all the people that sit there and think, are you talking about work salvation, that I'm doing it myself? No. We're talking about you walking in the way of the Word of God and doing the works of God and working out your own salvation, being obedient to what He says, doing His work, not your work. If we don't do what He says, are we going to be right before Him? No. No way. We also see another thing about being walking worthy, being a witness before the Lord, and even suffering persecution. These ones were preaching the gospel, turning the whole place upside down, and they were all mad about it. And so they were commanding him. To, they said, didn't we straightly command you? You should not teach in this name, and behold, you filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and tend to bring this man's blood upon us. They were preaching the gospel. And then they, you know, they continued as they were preaching the gospel. And of course, they said, we must obey God rather than men. And so they were speaking of all this, this cut these guys to the heart. They wanted to kill them. And so here they were all upset about it. And as they come down here, they had their meeting and decided they weren't going to do anything because they'd be overthrowing what God wanted, possibly, if they, if they did some evil things to them. But what they do? They called the apostles, beat them, commanded them they should not, commanded them they should not speak in the name of Jesus. You can't do this anymore. What did they do? They departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Persecution will come. You endure persecution. If you do, you'll be counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Because they were not wanting him to preach the gospel. But look what happened. Did they quit? No. Daily in the temple and every house they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. God delivered them out of the attack. He will deliver us. Remember what the Scripture says when it talks about, Yea, all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. There will be persecution. But what happens? He says, All the persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. He will deliver you out of all those. If you're watching and praying and walking uprightly before Him and you're not going to compromise, He'll deliver you out of those things. This is all part of walking worthy before the Lord. You and I are called to be a witness. We are called to preach the gospel. And we cannot back off of doing what He says. Romans 8, 18 says, I reckon the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. You know, God's glory is going to be revealing us as we're doing what He says, as He's going to manifest to us. We're walking right and upright before Him. But we will have sufferings that will come against us. Receiving God's Word and doing what He says is absolutely essential because how are we to live? We're to live according to the Word of God and be obedient in all things of what He tells us to do. Look what He says here about these guys as the Word came to them. In, Luke, in Acts 13, 46, Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said it was necessary the word of God should first have been spoken to you, to the Jews. But seeing you put it from you, you didn't receive it. You rejected it. And you judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life. Meaning what you do with the word judges yourself. If you receive the word, then you'll be receiving what God wants to be able to receive the eternal life. These guys were judging themselves unworthy of everlasting life. So, of course, then they turned to the Gentiles. The point is, as you receive God's Word and you do what He says, you'll be judged worthy of whatever kind of blessing it might be. But if you reject it, you'll be considered unworthy of being able to receive, whether it's everlasting life or any kind of promise from God. Also, your track record in life is important. Matthew chapter 15, when Paul and Barnabas had come back from the missionary journey, there was one who was talking about John left them and didn't continue in the work. Was he faithful? No. Did he continue in the work? No. Did he do what he's supposed to do? No, he left and quit. Did he have a track record of being faithful and following and doing what the Lord wanted? No. Well, Barnabas wanted to take him. They had a, quite a, it says, uh, 
They were going to go and visit to these places, and Barnabas determined to take with them John again. I don't know. Paul thought not good to take him with him, and who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. He thought it was not good. This is the word axio, which means judging worthy. It's the same word, deserving, fit, that it was right for him to be taken. Why? Because he wasn't faithful before. His track record was he quit. He turned back. He wasn't faithful. Are we going to take someone else who hasn't shown himself to be faithful? No. After this, they split. You never hear about Barnabas again, because Barnabas wanted to do the wrong thing. Paul wanted to do the right thing. You can only take someone who's going to be worthy is going to be someone who's going to be shown to be faithful. Your track record in life is important if you're going to be shown to be worthy before the Lord. Can he count on you? Are you going to be there? Are you going to be on and off, up and down, in every which way? Are you going to be consistent? Can he know that you are going to do things? Your works show your track record whether you're worthy or not. In Romans chapter 1, verse 28, Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. They didn't want to hear the word. They didn't want the knowledge of God. They didn't like to retain God in their knowledge. In, no, in knowledge. There is added. It's really in knowledge. Or, as it says here, they did not approve having God in knowledge. They, didn't, they wanted to do their own thing. What is God going to do? If you reject his knowledge, are you going to be shown to be worthy before him? No. God gave them over to a reprobate mind, an unapproved mind, and what happens if you have an unapproved mind because you haven't been doing what God says? You're going to do something. What are you going to do? You're going to do all these other things that are wrong. To do the things that are not convenient or are not becoming or fit, this means. Something is not fit or becoming or right before the Lord. So what they do? They start doing all these evil things. They get filled with all this unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, all these things. They're walking the wrong way. These are the people that are going to have a reprobate mind that will do these things that are not chosen to keep the knowledge of God and do it. You can't get the knowledge of God and then not do it and think you're going to keep it. No, it'll be taken away. And you get a reprobate mind. And you'll end up be doing all these things. This is what's going to happen to the fallaway crowd. They're going to have pleasure in the unrighteousness because the Antichrist is going to tell them everything is fine. He's going to be speaking the things against the true and living God. He's the man of sin, the man who's the lawless one. And lawless is going to abound because of all these things. And this is going to, these guys are going to be in trouble. And they're going to be judged, of course. They're going to, they're going to end up being judged and wiped out and not make it because they'll end up taking the mark because they're not choosing the way of the Lord. All these things filled with backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable and merciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death. That's quite a statement. People who commit those things that were just listed are worthy of death. If you go back to the list, it's quite a list. It's not just real bad stuff. I mean, envy, you're worthy of death. Debate, you're worthy of death. Deceit, you're worthy of death. Bad character, malignity, you're worthy of death. Whisperers, worthy of death. That's all sin, isn't it? Every one of these things are sin. Backbiters, proud, worthy of death. Despiteful, disobedient to parents, worthy of death. Aren't children commanded to obey their parents in the Lord, for this is right? The promise it'll be well with them and they'll, they'll live long on the earth. What if they don't? The opposite happens. They're worthy of death. That's quite a statement. These people, unmerciful, they're worthy of death. They commit such things, they are worthy of death. 
not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. We're going to be in trouble. We must walk in line with the Word of God. That shows you something. Who's worthy of death? Those people who walk wrong. We must walk worthy of the Lord. If we don't walk worthy of the Lord, we are in trouble. We see over in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 something further. Verse 2. Do you know, not know, do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? In the millennial reign, the saints, and who are the saints? Not just everybody who's born again, the holy ones. Remember, only the ones who are going to be presented to Jesus are the ones who are holy, without spot, without wrinkle, holy, without blemish. These are the ones that are presented to him. The holy ones are going to judge the world. If the world be judged by you, are you unworthy? Are you unfit to judge the smallest matters? We should be able to judge things. How do you judge anything? By the Word of God. You don't judge it by your thoughts or your attitudes or your opinions or what you think about it. Everything is to be judged according to the Word of God. So, how are you going to be ready? You have the Word of God in you. That's going to produce holiness, and you're going to be in a position to judge the world in the life to come. That's why you've got to know the Word. And he says, hey, are you unworthy even to judge the smallest matters? Which, why would it make them un considered unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Because they don't know the Word. Meaning, if you don't know the Word, you're considered unworthy. Because you can't judge even the smallest matters. Or you're not holy. Because only the holy ones are going to be able to judge him. So you're going to be considered unworthy if you don't know the word or if you're not holy before God. God wants us to be fit and worthy. You'll be fit and worthy in the measure you know the word. That's why God wants you in the word, hearing the word, doing the word, knowing the word, and walking in it. It is absolutely essential for you in your life. Philippians chapter 1. Verse 27. This is a very strong message tonight, but it's the truth, and we need to understand it. Philippians 1.27. Only let your conversation, when it talks about your conversation here, this is not talking about your talk, because this is a word which refers to you being a citizen or behaving as a citizen, conducting yourself as a citizen. What are you a citizen of? You're a citizen of heaven when you get born again. You're not of this world. Where's our citizenship's in heaven. Only let your citizenship from heaven, which is to be directing your character in all you do, be as it becometh, is as suitable, worthy, in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. How are you and I supposed to function according to the word of God? You're a citizen of heaven. How can you be born from above and a citizen of heaven and you're walking along in the ways of the flesh and sin and just doing whatever you want and think that you're, gonna, you're showing forth the gospel of Christ? No way. Remember, you're an ambassador for Christ. You're sent from heaven to here. You're not of this world. You're in this world, but not of this world because you were born from above, remember. That's why you seek the things above, not the things on the earth. You've got to know the things above. How am I going to know them? Through the Word. So your behavior as a citizen is to be showing that you are worthy, you're walking worthy of the gospel of Christ. And how's that going to be further shown? That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you are doing right, which is what? You are standing fast in one spirit. You are standing firm, persevering, persisting, keeping your standing you're, you're the real deal. You're walking the walk. With one, not mind, it's the word suke, which is the word which means soul. This is why Young's translates it one soul correctly. With one soul, what's your soul made up of? Will, intellect, emotions. It means your will can't be all over the place. You can't be double-minded this way and that way. A double-minded man's unstable in all of his ways. He's two-souled, remember? 
He can't take hold of anything of the Lord, the Bible even says. You're to, and when it says one, it's very interesting. Here's the first word for one. It's the general word for one in the Greek, heis. Here's the second word for one. It's a different word. It's the word mia, which means only one. It's more specific saying only one soul. Meaning, we got to get one sold in the Lord. Our will is set to choose the way of the Lord. Our mind is renewed to the truth and we're thinking correctly. And we're going to make sure that our direction that we go, it's our soul yielding to the Spirit, is going to be in line with the Word of God. So you're going to stand fast in one spirit and only one soul, striving together for the faith of the gospel. That shows that you are walking in a manner worthy of the gospel. That means if you're double-minded, are you worthy of the gospel? Are you walking in a way worthy of the gospel? No. Two sold all over the place? No. We are, so we brought messages in the past how we're to be in one accord, one mind, one mindset, one soul. All these things are absolutely essential if you are going to be shown to be worthy before the Lord. And in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. Otherwise, you don't let anything steer you away. It doesn't matter who's against you. You choose to walk in the ways as a citizen of heaven, showing that you are walking worthy of the way of the Lord. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, in verse 11. You are witnesses, and God also, verse 10, first to start out, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. Hey, these guys, they were walking in holiness, they were walking in righteousness, were just, they were unblameable before the Lord. And as you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged everyone who was a father, thus his children, that you would walk worthy of God. We were showing this by walking holy and justly and walking right. You're to be doing the same thing. You are to be walking worthy of God who has called you, as it says, into king, his kingdom and glory. Although it's not quite right here. This makes you think he already called you. No, it's a present tense verb, as you will see. That's why it's translated is calling you unto his kingdom and glory, meaning the call of God is an ongoing effect in your life because you are to be doing the word in an ongoing manner to enter into what he has for you. Ruling and reigning and seeing the manifest presence of God, the glory of God. You're called continually or, being, or is calling you to his own kingdom and glory. You're to rule and reign and you are to obtain the glory of the Lord. Every one of us are to obtain it in our life. This is why they said they receive the word of God. Not you receive it as in truth, the word of God that effectually works in you that believe. So how are you going to walk worthy of the Lord? You're going to walk in line with the word. You're going to be holy. You're going to be righteous and justly and unblameable before the Lord because you're going to walk uprightly before him. That shows you're worthy before him. All these things are your works and your, the things you do, isn't it? The fruit in your life. 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 3. We're bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it's meet, or as, as it's shown to be worthy. This means meriting something that's worthy. Remember, worthy has to do with meriting something because of your works. That you're, because you're, why were they shown to be worthy? Why were they shown to be meriting being worthy before God? Because they were doing what God told them to do, and the results is shown. Because your faith groweth exceedingly. That means they're, plot, they're hearing the word, they're applying the word, they're working their faith, and it's growing. And the charity or love of every one of you towards each other abounds. You're functioning in faith, you're walking in love, and everything that you do, that is what God wants. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecutions, tribulations that you endure. You're going to endure these attacks because the attacks will be there. Which is a manifest token 
of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. Again, as you are enduring anything that's coming at you, any kind of persecution or tribulation, you're growing in faith and walking in love regardless, as we see, you're going to be shown in the face of the persecutions or the attacks that come against you as being account counted worthy of the kingdom of God, even though you're sucked because of the things you suffer. God wants us. Otherwise, the evidence and the proof of this righteous judgment of God that will come to you is you're counted worthy because you've endured all these things and you've walked the walk in the face of what comes to come at you. And then he says the next verse, seeing it's a righteous thing with God to recompense or pay back tribulation to them that trouble you. Remember, you don't pay it back, but guess who's going to pay it back? God's going to pay it back. What a person sows, they will reap. Don't think anybody's going to get away with it. Nobody gets away with anything. It's going to come upon them. And God's the one that is the just, not you and me. We also see in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and verse 11. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling. Well, I mean, it's not automatic, is it? Depends on whether he does count you worthy of this calling. And when he talks about counting you worthy of this calling, the word for wherever the verb is, count worthy of the calling, this is a subjunctive mood verb, which means it's a conditional statement means that he might count you worthy of this calling. Not that he automatically will. He says, I'm praying for you that God might count you worthy of this calling. Why would he count you worthy of the calling? Because you obeyed it. Because you're walking in it. Because you're doing what he says. You're following the Lord. You're carrying out the word of God. Doing what he says. You're fulfilling all the good pleasure of his goodness. That's going to show that you're going to be worthy. You're fulfilling what he tells you to do. And the work of faith with power, you're fulfilling it because you're working your faith. The working of faith is not just for you to get your own healing or deliverance or get my provision or whatever. It's for you to be shown worthy. That God would count you worthy of the calling because you obey and you do what he wants. That's a bigger picture to this, isn't it? If it's just all out for me, 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 get my healing, deliverance and stuff, and you don't realize the big picture... You're not tuned in right. It's the big picture is that he will count you worthy if you meet the conditions of his calling because you fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and you accomplish this work of faith with power. And the name of the Lord is glorified in you and in you and him because you have been ruling and reigning and conquering with the name of Jesus and speaking the word of God. And you've been working your faith with power. You've been fulfilling all the good pleasure of his goodness. That means what? You've been doing the works, haven't you? You've been working out all the things that God tells you. He's going to count you worthy if you have met the conditions that he says. And that's what God wants for every single one of us. We are to walk worthy of the Lord. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be, it says, able, but it's not the word able. It's the same word that we've seen. Who are showing themselves to be fit or worthy, or in this sense, sense competent. You'll be worthy and fit if you're competent to teach others also. Otherwise, the things that you've heard, you're going to commit it to faithful men, not to somebody that's here one minute and not, can't count on them what they're going to be here or not. Faithful men, the ones who also have, are competent, they're worthy, they're fit to teach others because they got the word in them. And you know, you know they're going to teach things accurately. There's not very many people out there that are faithful 
that really got the word in them and are ready in a position to be able to teach others because they haven't paid the price, which is studying the word day in and day out and getting the word in you and learning the word thoroughly and being able to teach it to others. That is what God wants. We also see down here in, in uh, Revelation, walking worthy. We talked about this this morning, but we're going to talk about it again tonight. Revelation 3, 4. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. If they defiled their garments, they're not right. They're not righteous. They're in sin. They're in trouble. Are they going to be considered worthy? No. But a few ones who didn't defile their garments, they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Who's worthy? The ones that walk with him in white. Who's not worthy? The ones that have defiled their garments and haven't cleaned up and haven't done what God says. It doesn't matter if you're born again or not. It matters what you're doing. Of course, you've got to be born again. I mean, that matters, of course. But just because you're born again and then you're walking in all this defiled stuff, are you going to be right? Are you going to be found worthy? No way. Nope. Only the guys who walk in white are going to be worthy. And further, what else does it say about them? He that overcomes, which means to conquer and carry off the victory. You and I are expected to conquer and carry off the victory. We can, because he's made us more than conquerors. He's given us all the weapons of warfare. He tells us every one of us were expected to conquer and overcome and carry off the victory. That's what it said to every one of those churches. And then you see the, the blessings and the promises. The guy who conquers and carries off the victory, he's obviously walking in white. He's worthy. That worthy one who's walking in white and conquering and overcoming, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And remember, that's what's necessary to be clean and white if you're going to be with the marriage of the Lamb. And notice, because he's found worthy, I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. Well, that's good news. But I'll confess his name before my father, before his angels. So who's not going to be blotted out of the book? The guy who has not defiled his garments. He's walking worthy of the Lord, walking in white. He's conquered and carried off the victory. And because of that, he's clothed in white raiment. How about the guy who's defiled? How about the guy who's not walking worthy of the Lord? That hasn't conquered or overcome. He's got defeated left and right, walking in sin. Is he going to be clothed in white raiment? Nope. His name's going to get blotted out of the book of life. He'd never say such a statement here if someone was going to get blotted out and someone was not going to get blotted out. Since I will not blot your name out of the book of life, implying that some are going to get blotted out and I'm not going to blot yours out, meaning he could blot them out. And we know that's the truth. That's why you and I must not have defiled garments. We must walk in white to be worthy. What if you walk in sin? You're in trouble. Look what it says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 and following. If we sin willfully, we know what we're doing. We know what's right, and we choose to not do what's right. After that, we have received the precise, correct knowledge of God. We know what's right, but we, sin we didn't do it. In fact, we did wrong willfully. If we receive the precise, correct knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins to get out of the situation, but a fearful, certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. That's the word. That's the truth. Judgment is coming. He that despised Moses' law, they died without mercy under two or three witnesses. They killed him. They were worthy of death because of what they were doing. Of how much sore punishment? Suppose ye shall he be thought worthy. Shall you be thought worthy of? Remember those guys that walked in sin were worthy of death, weren't they? How much sore punishment shall he be thought worthy of? 
And why? Because he's trodden underfoot the Son of God. When do you trod underfoot the Son of God? When you sin willfully against the Word. Has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified in a holy thing. When do you do that? When you walk in sin. Because now the blood is not cleansing you anymore because only the guys that walk in the light, as he is in the light, then the blood will be applied to cleanse them. But if you're not, you, the blood's no big thing, so I'm going to walk in sin, the attitude is. And has done insult. Despite means insult to the Spirit of grace. The Spirit of grace is God's favor that's supposed to work in your life. And it's available if you meet the conditions. Well, if you don't walk in line with the word of His grace, are you going to see the Spirit of grace manifest? No. You're insulting the Spirit of grace. You're shutting Him down from working. What's going to happen? You're going to be thought, you're going to be getting punished. You're not going to get away with it. Now, this, this is pretty intense. But this is the Word of God. I'll tell you, if you're, any of you are walking in sin in any areas, you best do your business before God and get these things out of your life. Matthew 22, look at this. Here's the wedding. They're going out there find a, trying to find all the people to come to the wedding. He said to the servants, the wedding's ready, but they which were bidden or called, they weren't worthy. We couldn't find anybody who was worthy. What's that tell you? You got to be worthy if you're going to be in the wedding. If you're unworthy, you won't be in the wedding. So they went out there and they found whoever they could call to the marriage. Remember, you've got to be worthy if you're going to be there. They're calling everybody. They're calling whoever they can find. They went out in the highways, gathered together as many as they found, both bad and good. So they, they wanted to bring everybody to it. The wedding was furnished with guests. But when they come to the wedding, you've got to have the wedding garment on. Otherwise, you're not going to be found worthy. The king came in to see the guests. He saw there a man who had not on a wedding garment. What this means, this is enduo, means he didn't clothe himself. It means that because it's a middle voice. In the Greek means the subject is doing it for his benefit. He did not clothe himself with a wedding garment. In fact, this is also tells you another revelation. Because it's a perfect tense verb. The perfect tense in the Greek means past action completed with present effects at the time of speaking. In other words, action that has been completed in the past however long it took, but the point is, here it was, here's the results of it at the time of speaking. Meaning, they obviously had done this work and it was effective at the time of speaking. Meaning, he had put on in the past and was walking in this wedding garment, which is what? Clean and white and holy. He's in trouble. Friend, how came in there hither not having a wedding garment? You speechless. What'd they do with him? Was he going to stay in the wedding? No. The king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There'll be weeping and gnashing, gnashing of teeth. And then he makes the statement, many are called, but few are chosen. Who gets chosen? The ones with a wedding garment on. Who's called? Everybody's called. They had the bad and the good, all came. Who was found worthy? He said, I can't find anybody that's worthy. So they said, just bring everybody here and we'll try to get them in straight and get them all, get the wedding garment on. Obviously, they were all instructed to put the wedding garment on because one guy comes in and says, hey, where's your wedding garment? He didn't obey. He got tossed out. Only few are chosen because only few, unfortunately, are going to be found worthy because they put the wedding garment on. Here's another scripture. You can handle another one. Luke chapter 12, verse 45. But, and if that servant say in his heart, my Lord delays his coming, he's not coming yet. I can do whatever I want to do. I can walk in any way of sin I want. 
began to beat the men, ser men servants and maidens, eat and drink and be drunken and party and have a good time. Hmm. The Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, in an hour when he's not aware, and will cut him asunder. He's going to be cut asunder, or appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. He's in trouble. It means he's not going to be saved. But look at the next one. The servant which knew his Lord's will, he knew the word, and prepared not himself to do it, neither did according to his will. What's going to happen to him? He's going to be beaten with many stripes. There's going to be a punishment. That's quite a statement. And he that knew not, didn't know, should have known, but didn't know. Say, who, who could that be, maybe? Maybe someone who got born again at the other end and didn't get the knowledge of God yet in him. And did commit things worthy of stripes. Otherwise, the things, remember, you're worthy of punishment when you sin willfully? That's worthy of stripes. Worthy of punishment. He's going to be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given of him shall be much required. That means whatever is given to you, God requires you to walk in it. And if you say, well, I don't, maybe don't want to get anything. Well, you're still going to be beaten because if you don't know the Lord's will, you're still going to be beaten. No, the answer is get the word of God. You want to be in a position in the millennial reign to rule and reign? You got to know the word. You got to be walking in the word. You got to know how to rule and reign and, and to be able to judge things according to the word. To be shown, found worthy. Of a much will be required. To him, to whom men have committed much, of him will they ask the more. God wants you to put your all in all to studying the word, learning the word, carrying it out, doing what he says. It's your life. Remember, your life's a vapor. Short time. All your works. You're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give account for everything. And we're going to be rewarded according to Him. You're going to get rewards if your works stand and abide. But if not, you're going to suffer loss. Not only will you get stripes beaten for all the sins, as this one says, but you're also going to suffer loss. That's what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 14 and 15. It speaks of that. We want to make sure we are walking in the ways of the Word. Now, one last scripture before we close. Revelation chapter 5. Remember who's the worthy one? Look at first of all, who's the worthy one? Jesus. What's He doing? He's making you worthy as well. How? Because you walk worthy of the Lord by being obedient and doing everything He says, and you will be shown to be worthy because of your works, because of your fruit, because of your walk, because of your character, because of all the things that you're doing. You're fulfilling His pleasure. You're walking by faith. Your faith's growing. You're increasing in everything. You're walking in love. All these things that we've seen. And then we come to chapter 5. See, Jesus had to be worthy as well. Remember, he had to walk the walk that Adam had failed, and he did nothing of himself. He did everything that the Father told him to do. He had to walk the walk as well. In fact, we need to look at one other scripture to show you before we look at this one. You've got to understand what Jesus, he had to do this. Hebrews 5.8, Though you were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. He had to be obedient, and he was obedient. And being perfected, not made perfect, but being perfected, being perfect, how is he perfect? Because he obeyed. He did exactly what God told him to do. He became the author of eternal salvation. Now, that's good news. To who? All them that obey him, this is the present tense, meaning all those obeying him, ongoing action. Jesus had to obey the Father in everything, and he did. He had to conquer every attack of the enemy. He was, to, in all tempt, he was tempted in all points, yet without sin. Now, 
If you and I sin, we can confess our sin. He will, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we truly repent, turn around and do what he says to get cleansed and walk in the ways of the Lord. We can come to the same place. Because remember, we're to go on to perfection just like Jesus became perfect. We're told God will accomplish that work in, it, in us. Because what kind of church is Jesus going to present to himself? One that's holy, one that's unrebukable, unreprovable, one that has come to perfection. See, that's the purpose. The ministry is to the, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the, to bring them to the place of being the full man of the stature in Christ. We have to look at that. Sorry we're going on, but we just have to follow the flow. Ephesians 4.11 Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, what are they supposed to be doing? Not just pumping up the people and trying to fleece them of money and build their own kingdom and do all these things. <laughs> They're supposed to be teaching the word, perfecting the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all might come, a subjunctive mood, in the unity of the faith and of the precise, correct knowledge of the Son of God. They better be teaching the word or they're in trouble unto the perfect man. We're coming on to perfection, to be like Jesus. Remember, one of the things we talked about we clothe ourselves with is you put on the Lord Jesus Christ. You clothe yourself with Jesus. You're becoming like him. Unto the measure of the stature. The stature is a metaphor meaning of the attained state fit for a thing. You come to the attained state of the fullness of Christ. Remember, that's what he was going to judge those guys in Revelation. He said, the guy that was a Christian in name only, he says, your works are not fulfilled. Why not? You're in trouble. Let me show you this. Revelation chapter 3. I know their works Thou hast the name that thou livest, and you're dead. <laughs> They're Christians in name only. They're not doing the word. Be watchful and strengthen the things that remain, or that are ready to die. A whole lot's died out, and about everything else is about to die out. For I have not found thy works not perfect. It's the word filled up, fulfilled, as Young brings it. Because your works have to be fulfilled before God, if you're going to come to the place of perfection and see the work of God be accomplished in your life. That is what God is going to bring us to. Jesus did everything that the Father told him to do. And he was declared to be worthy. That's why the Father would say, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Why was he well pleased? Because he obeyed everything he told him to do. People that think that Jesus just came down and operated as God and it was it, that's lying teaching. He, had, he was tempted at every point. He was pressed every which way. He made all the right choices. He obeyed everything that the Father told him to do. He did nothing of himself. That's where you and I must come to. That's why you've got to live unto him, not unto yourself. If you're living unto yourself, you're not going to be found worthy because you're walking after the flesh. You've got to put the word first place. Because he was found worthy, what would he do? This is when the right hand was of the, on the throne, a book written within and on the back side, sealed with the seven seals. This book that was written within and on the back side, that is a title deed. And this is the title deed to the earth that Adam gave into the hands of Satan to rule for the 6,000 years that man was supposed to rule. And Jesus prevailed over the devil and conquered him, as we see in verse 5, when they were wondering, who could open this book? There's nobody worthy to open it up. Because that's what they were saying. We come back here. Who's worthy to open the book? Who's worthy? And to loose the seals. Who's worthy to reclaim possession of the earth, the title deed, and to loose the seals thereof, 
and to bring the judgments that the judgments have to come on the enemies and they have to be wiped out and eliminated. Judgment has to come on all the ungodly and on the devil and anybody that's in his camp, and it will. No man in heaven and earth or under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look upon thereon. But somebody was. I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and read the book, neither to look upon. Ah, they said, the elders said, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, he has conquered. Prevailed means conquered. It's the word nakao. He has conquered and carried off the victory. Jesus conquered and carried off the victory over the devil and everything that could come against him, every evil spirit's work. He has conquered to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. He had to be worthy and to conquer to be able to be in that position. You and I need to be worthy and to conquer to be able to possess everything that God has for us. And he expects us to do this. This is why it says in Revelation 21, verse 7, He that conquers and carries off the victory, same word, continually, present tense, shall inherit all things, everything. We want the full inheritance. It's everything that God has for us. I will be his God and he shall be my son. If you and I walk worthy of the Lord, we'll see it all happen. If we don't walk worthy of the Lord, we won't see it happen. You go back over this message and see all the things that are brought forth. We must walk worthy of the Lord, otherwise we're worthy of punishment or worthy of death, or not even, or might not be worthy even to attain to that age and the resurrection of the dead. We saw that scripture. Make your decision. You're going to put Jesus Christ first place in your life. You're going to walk in line with the Word. You're going to walk worthy of the calling which you have, a calling of God that's upon your life. Because remember, many are called, but only few are chosen. That's why he's praying for them. I'm praying for you, as we saw back there in 2 Thessalonians. You've got to understand what this prayer is all about. I'm praying for you that God might count you worthy, which is a junctive mood, remember, of the calling. Because he knows if you're not counted worthy of the calling, that means you're not going to be chosen, which means you're sunk. You're out of here. <laughs> and what are you going to do? You're going to fulfill the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. This is a tremendous prayer that he's praying. It has eternal ramifications. You and I, must walk worthy before the Lord. Say this with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the Word of God that brings revelation that I am to walk worthy of the calling of God that is upon my life and walk uprightly in holiness, righteousness, showing myself through the fruit, through my works, through all that I do, that I'm walking worthy before the Lord as I'm obedient in all things. I'm walking in white and I'll be found worthy. I conquer and overcome. I'll be found worthy. I thank you, Lord. I am putting the word of God first place in my life and I will walk worthy before the Lord shown forth by my actions, my fruit, my works, my doings, my track record, my faithfulness, I thank you that I am making the Word of God first place in all that I do. And I thank you that as I walk worthy before the Lord, then I will fulfill the good pleasure and the work of faith with power and glorify the Lord and I will enter into what I've been called to, that I'm to be worthy of the kingdom and the glory of the rule and reign in the life to come. And the manifestation of the glory of God will come in my life if I am found worthy. 
Therefore, I will walk worthy before the Lord all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. We went about 15 minutes beyond, but we had to deliver this. This is an earth-shaking message for every one of us if you're not on, on the right road. We want to walk uprightly before God. Father, I thank you that we all have ears to hear and we will walk worthy before you because we see all the things that, that we've we're brought forth, all the effects if we do or if we don't. So we will walk worthy before you all the days of our life. Thank you for accomplishing this great work in us because we're hearers and doers of this word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.